Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Too Many Men podcast. My name is Allison Lucan, and I, I don't know if I, if I even deserve to be in the company of, of these amazing people I'm about to introduce. First, friends, I rave about this person's writing all the time. This is a voice that is matched nowhere in literally the world. But if you have not yet, run, do not walk to read the incredible Sarah Sivian's piece on the Vancouver Canucks. I don't care if you love hockey for the X's and O's. I don't care if you love it for the fandom. I don't care if you love it for nostalgia. Arguably one of the best things ever written. She is incredible. She has a gift. I can't believe she graces us with her time. Sarah Sivian, how the hell are you? That one really got me. That was the nicest thing I think you've ever said about me. And I have a list of nice things you've said. Um, shout out to my editor. He came up with the idea. He's like, I know you and the late great Jason Botchford were close. I was hesitant to do anything at first, right? Like you don't want to make that about you, right? But after sitting with the Canucks loss and the way it all ended and the way it all happened, it just felt like there was a story that kind of came out of me. So credit to my editor for following through with me and kind of like making the hard edits where it was kind of a word vomity type thing and having the idea. So thanks to him. But yeah, that RIP the 2024 Canucks, um, you showed us that there is hope and it was great to watch you. I would read y'all a segment, but it's out there on Twitter. And I actually don't know if I could read it without tearing up. Um, but it, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Kudos to you as always. You keep one-upping yourself, which I didn't know was even possible, my friend. But we are also in the company of incredible greatness because, friends, she is fucking back. <laughs> Insider, gossip girl, Shayna Goldman, who still, and we will, if y'all want to comment on this, we can comment on this, continues to break trades and continues to not get credit from the old <laughs> white hockey men who have their panties in a bunch and can't say, as first <laughs> mentioned by Hey Shay. So, Hey Shay, the Goldman, how are you? Say hi. Hi. I'm, I'm amazing. I mean, you just up yourself every week. But yeah, just like a little, like, I don't expect them to play along and be like, spotted. S had it first, which like listen. <laughs> I know we don't, we don't all watch Gossip Girl, which if you didn't, there's a summer. There's a summer ahead. You you better get going. But like, you know, it's fine. It's not fine. It is not it's fine. It's really though. not. But yeah. We just it's, need to keep banging the drum. It's always interesting. Like it's I feel like we talked about this a lot this year because of uh the Demko stuff. And I know we've yeah. talked about it a lot before, but like, it's always so funny to me when it's like, you wait till someone else has something to say for people to be like, oh, okay. Or what, how could you have this or blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's yeah. always, it's always so interesting. And sorry, can I ask you, did, did Demko play round two? Like we heard he could? He was going to game eight and people still with this Botchford story are like, it's okay. She got that wrong. I didn't get it wrong. Where is he? Hello? Did he play this postseason? Thatcher, where are you? He's not there. He didn't play. Hello? Can, can you reconfirm I still what wrong? your report was? <laughs> that he who was done for the season and the season's over. Don't mm -hmm. know where he is. No signs of existence. Did he play after game one? No. Did he even back up after game one? No. He oh. skated. Oh. So I was wrong. Hmm. Anyway, anyway. But enough about us. It is time for, for to see of Benny Drawbars and Sarah Sivian. What, my good friend? So, it gets me that <laughs> some weeks we're getting the stick some weeks we're getting the drums some weeks we're getting taylor swift it's like it's a bit of mystery every week and i just appreciate it that is the point thank you for getting that i didn't want to do overdo it with the taylor swift so she will be popping up when the mood behooves me but for now we're just straight to the news as we should be well sarah you remain a gift in every single way let's get on with it 
first and foremost, let's go to our friends in the PWHL. Like, if you are looking for drama and storylines, the women are giving it to us. Let's go first to the one semifinal. And Shana, you called this. So Toronto comes out on top and has the, we think, luxury of being able to pick their opponent to advance, hopefully, to the final. They pick Minnesota. And Shana, what happens? <laughs> It's like you pick your poison. I mean, do I think they would have beaten Minnesota if Natalie Spooner was healthy? Of course. Yes. But she got hurt and it just didn't work in their favor. It is. It was a rule I would decline. I love that they're trying it, but it's a rule I personally would decline. I'd be like, you know what? Let's just go with the natural order of things, which is what they did, right? They went with the fourth seed, but still. Uh, Toronto didn't make it out of the first round. PWHL style. So this is a good point because we love that the women are trying some of these different rules, right? Because they're trying some of the things that we clamor for, arguably on the men's side as well. This is just one example. But I think like every so often in the NHL, Sarah, we hear this whole narrative of like, they should reseed or they should, you know, if there's a play-in, it should be for the top seed to be able to pick their opponent or what have you. It's one time and it's one time only. Is this idea of being able to give the top teams some sort of choice in who they play something you'd like to see bleed over into the men's game? Oh, it's fucking awesome. I mean, the storylines that come out of it, yes, I'd love to see that. Imagine what we could write. We wouldn't even have to make shit up. We could actually have a storyline that like, we aren't forcing. I think it's fantastic. Um, is it realistic for an already established league? I don't think so when we can't even know what the rule of goaltender interference is. Like, God forbid, we couldn't handle that. The the men aren't mature enough for this, but the women are, and it's been awesome. I, I love the opportunity the PWHL has taken with a new league forming. You know what I mean? They're making things yeah. interesting. Like in a way, if this was already an established league, they might not be able to. So we move into the final, the first championship in the league's history, and it's Boston who comes in via incredulous form versus Minnesota. Again, as Shana pointed out, Minnesota being the fourth seed. So you didn't know if their chances were good. They fall the first game, but the second game is what I affectionately like to call Sophie Jake's revenge in the player who was involved in the first ever trade in the PW who left Boston in a move to go to Minnesota. And Shana has already talked about how that was a move that both teams probably needed to make comes in and revenge tour style scores two to secure a win in the second game of, of the final. Shayna, what stood out to you in this final series or maybe just game two so far? Honestly, if you told me before the season started, we were getting Boston, Minnesota, I've been like, yep, that clicks. Totally makes sense, right? Like when we saw the, the teams on the surface and we were just making our predictions, like it felt like they had it. And then the season went on and you're like, oh, especially Boston. So it's so interesting, but it it makes for a fun final because, I mean, for us selfishly, right? Like we're seeing some of the best American stars in this. There's a lot of Hockey Canada influence in, you know, Montreal and in um, Toronto. But for us, like we're getting Aaron Frankel, who's been unreal this postseason. And we're mm -hmm. getting obviously friend of the pod, Hillary Knight. But you're just, it's it's fun with like the Taylor Heisies in the world and Grace yeah. Umwinkle and Kendall Coyne Schofield. Like it, it's what you want. And Lee Steckline, like. Oh my God, she's amazing. So it's interesting. I think, I feel like we're getting a full five game series, which is nice because we didn't see that in round one. But yeah, like we saw Boston surprise with a, a really good game one win. And now we're seeing the Sophie Jake's revenge game that we love to see. Love to see that. It's so interesting too. Like the two teams on the side of that trade are now in the final and both players are making their impact in this series. Like it's great for the narratives. It's, it's a very encouraging start to what we hope is a very long history for this league. And we're loving these storylines. We're loving the drama. Like you said, Shana, we're loving the quality of the hockey, but you know, something that's been an important through line, <clears throat> excuse me, as the women's game has gone on is doing it as well as you possibly can. And when you love something as much as I know so many people, including the three of us do, like we love women's hockey, we want to see it be at, our, be at its best. And while the game last night had some really great stories and some really exciting moments, there was some critique about some of the broadcast choices, airing interviews during gameplay and not necessarily showing all the right things. And 
while this is certainly easier said than done, Sarah, you're right there in the Boston area, but these games are not necessarily accessible to you based on where they've had to play or selected to play. I'm not going to put this solely on the team said, let me intentionally play an hour and a half outside of the city, of course. But what are some areas for improvement that we are starting to see, or maybe some things that the league should start to look at from your perspective, Sarah, to keep this momentum going when the hockey is so good, like we're seeing? Yeah, that's a great question. And I love their dedication to improving it. Obviously the team names and the team logos and stuff like that, which they, there have been reports that those are coming really soon, maybe before the end of the season, but now we're close to the end of the season. So probably not, but probably definitely before next season. Um, I think they're working on relocating from Lowell. It's just, it's a really tough out of the way of the city type place. And that's where you're wondering why more people aren't showing up. I mean, they had to play somewhere and there's all these debates, but hopefully they can get out of Lowell and closer to Boston proper. Um, yeah, I just think, I think it's been done really well, honestly. Like I don't have many complaints or issues given the way the league quickly came together and the way it had to for success and with the cap and everything like that um they're paying players more keep the good vibes going you know absolutely and yeah again i'm we're we're just looking at some nitpicking i know nicole yeah, has as we had, should. had some good points about just making the broadcast really look its best and that doesn't necessarily mean having to spend a lot more money it's what you choose to show and when you choose to show certain features but yeah. um keep getting better who figures at- it out first though the women or the men, because here we are, Stanley Cup final, all the investments oh. in the world, and we can't get it right on the men's side either. Listen, so if true. anyone can take that, like, I know everyone's always like, oh, the women shouldn't have to take shit and like it and have their grain of rice. But like, some, <laughs> sometimes, you know, like, just keep in mind, we still get it wrong everywhere else. So hopefully, yeah. I, I would bet that they fix it, though, before the men do, because let's be real here. Hopefully, hopefully for sure. And we talked about Sophie Jakes. Sophie Jakes, of course, a product of the Ohio State University. And Ohio State announced that they have extended their head coach, Nadine Muzeral, through the 28-29 season. This is a coach who has built this program out of nothingness to contender status, reaching the championship game three years in a row and winning the title the last two. Now, of course, they still don't have a rink. My God, these women deserve a facility that wasn't built over 100 years ago, but maybe that's just me, back to a grain of rice. (laughs) But Shayna, how important is it for the Buckeyes to keep Muzzerall happy behind the bench? She's such a good coach. Like, she's the slam dunk answer for who you should want. Um, The only reason to not have her behind the bench is if she wants to leave for bigger and better things and go to different levels and different opportunities and different tests of what a good coach she is. But like, this is, this is everything and more for Ohio state, because you could see her identity all over this team every single year. And at the college level, it's totally different, right? Because you might have more of a revolving door than you would elsewhere, especially now with players having the chance to go to one league, they might want to sooner. Like we don't know how this is going to go. And if it's going to start mirroring the men's game, you have to be a really good coach to manage that. And that's, you know, like you got, sometimes that means building such a strong foundation and strong system that you can just interchange parts. And I feel like if anyone's done it, she has. Sarah, we asked Hillary about this when she was on too, but you know, for a long time, the college side was really just two, maybe three programs in terms of prominence and to have another team come on the the landscape and really be a challenger legitimately year after year, like just in terms of growing the game, how valuable is that, that now there's just more and more programs saying we're legit, we're here to play. I mean, it's everything. It's really like, it's something I'm trying to appreciate every single day, even with something as insidious as sports gambling, right? Like you log on to FanDuel and it's like Caitlin Clark. There's literally one section for Caitlin Clark. And I saw Angel Reese um, is now chipping in to a DC soccer team. Like she's a co-owner. It's like, yeah, yeah. The way- these these women are building themselves up and they always have, but they are helping out intersport and everything. And it's just such a positive trajectory in, I don't know, it's wholesome. It's like 
we had our summer of Barbie and Taylor Swift and now we have our summer of women's sports, you know? It feels huge, right? Yeah. Like it feels like yeah. the WNBA, it feels huge right now. You go on Instagram or TikTok and it's like, here's Cameron Brink and now you're going to see Angel Reese doing something. Here's Caitlin Clark. Oh, and don't forget, you still have Sabrina crushing it in New York. Like you have all these players who are becoming household names immediately. It feels so big and I hope that momentum starts trickling into other sports too. I do want to say it's really upsetting to see some of the comments about Cameron Brink. Like, can you guys keep it in your fucking pants for 12 seconds? Like, we get yep. it. She's beautiful. She hoops. She's funny. She's cool. Like, do like you have to Otani? mention her looks? Every Yeah. Do you have yeah. to make it weird? Do you have to make everything weird? Like, have you ever met a woman before? I can't take the comments. <laughs> it is Answer, wild. no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, we've talked about the important side of hockey, JK, JK. There are some other coaching changes I guess we should get to. Um, first and foremost, you know what? Honestly, like I'm not even going to make this. How does this affect the Leafs? But Craig Berube was hired by Toronto. And what kind of cracks me up is that one of the biggest narratives I saw coming out of his whole press conference and everything is that, you know, the organization says we interview, we talked to nine different people and everyone's like, who were the nine? Like, no, the guy they hired is right there. But anyway, Craig Berube, former Leaf, now head of the Leafs behind the bench. Shayna, does it move the needle for you? No. Um, <laughs> okay, here's the thing. I know they did this whole extensive search, but to me, you know, like in draft day when he, had, he pulls out the paper and it's like Bonte Mac, no matter what, like it was Craig Berube, no matter what, like that was like in Brad Tree Living's pocket. He had it written on a little yellow scrap paper this entire time. It just felt like this was where they were going to go. And then when you heard those quotes on exit interview day, whatever it was, because yeah. they had two, um, they had like, you know, we need three, yeah. anyway. to do the unsexy things. It's like, yeah. there's your coach for it. And it's not an insult to Craig Berube. It's just that's the style. I feel like you get that hard-nosed style from him. I'm just curious about how this tenure for him is going to be different than everywhere else. Because it's not that he was a bad coach in St. Louis, per se. But I, I look at him and I'm like, maybe he could be your people manager, but he shouldn't be your tactician. You need to get some really innovative minds around him to, to get things going. And the Leafs need that. They need more offense. They need more defense. They need everything and more. If he's going to get everyone going, great. But what else does this bench look like? Because right now I'm like, okay, that's your choice. Interesting. Cool. Everyone's making a lot about how Barube is the coach that famously took the St. Louis Blues from last to first over the course of one season. And to Shayna's point, and she's talked about this before too, you can only do so much with the pieces that you're given, even if the pieces you're given include William Nylander and Austin Matthews. Sarah, is Barube the excuse me unsexy Barube the right choice for the Leafs given all of these pieces that are up in the air? Who is to say? Um, I don't think he can. Hurt, you are. Right? I know. I know. Um, yeah. Sure. Why? Like why not? I don't know. Who else? I I can't imagine saying yes to any coach no matter who or what like I can't imagine being that's the guy I just need them to show me I just need to see it yes so <laughs> another coach that we did kind of see it from and now is just going to keep showing it to us is Jim Hiller as we record today it's announced that the LA Kings have signed have removed the interim tag and made him head coach Shayna do we have thoughts I mean yes no I, I wonder I wonder what they're going to do with this roster. So to see if he's going to have different pieces to deal with because they have some cap space issues and players invested in players that maybe they shouldn't. But like, I'll give him credit. When he took over, you saw the Kings go from like this great team to open the year to just being terrible off the rush. Like it was unreal how bad their defense got out of nowhere for like an entire month. And he did fix it, right? Did he slow it down and really enforce that one through one? Yes. But did he fix their problem? Yes. The big problem, though, that they were still left with was that their offense got worse. So I'm curious how he can take the summer and figure out a way to balance that a little bit better so the Kings don't just shut down their opponents, but force them to play defense as well so you don't only play defense. Yeah. Sarah, does the Jim Hiller move excite you at no. all? Here's, okay, so here's my rant. Are you ready? I promise you a yes. rant. Here's yes. what, here's what, like, to your point of, like, who are we supposed to get excited about about who's out there? Every, in every other sport, if you know the coach that you want, regardless of if he's employed, you go get him. You take him from mm -hmm. another team. 
Why aren't we doing that? Why is it always like, oh, we'll have to wait and see if the guy we want is available. If you know the coach you want, and if that coach is employed by another team, get them from the other team. This is my, why, why is no one doing this? This is why not give up the draft pick. You'll trade a draft pick, a first round pick on a shitty defenseman, but you're not willing to spend it on a coach who maybe can transform your team. You're right. Like what, like if, if John Cooper is the guy you think should lead your team, why don't you go see if you can hire John Cooper? People are like, well, if he's available, who cares if he's available, go see if he wants to be available. This is what I don't like. It's the whole thing is the offer sheets. We're all so polite. Well, only if someone agrees, who cares? Instead of hiring these ridiculous coaches that may or may not be the right fit or you hire just because they're there, why don't we go get the guy we want? And if they're hired, you find a way to get them unhired and hire them into your organization. This is what I want to see in the NHL. No, I want a guy that got fired a month ago who's yeah. had no time this to is what think I'm about saying. why he got fired. And now I want to put him behind my bench. Why do we only interview people who are available? Well, I- and well, teams can say no, right? 100%. Like. This is the problem, though, because, right, like Mike Sullivan's in Pittsburgh and how many people were like, you would think the Devils would be calling for Mike Sullivan every day of the week and he wasn't given permission to talk, right? Correct. That's how it went down. How th- there's a coaches union, right? How can coaches or why should coaches be pushing for that to maximize themselves and their 100%. opportunities, right? hundred Like, exactly. Like if the coach says, if you don't let me interview, I will quit. I'm sure there's a way out of every con. There's a way out of everything, honestly. Like, yeah. So come on. Like, I don't, it just drives me absolutely batshit crazy. That was my big rant for the week. Solid rant. We love <laughs> Allison's good weekly rant. rant. We, that's what the drums <laughs> for. It's a good rant. It's a very good point that doesn't get talked about enough because everyone's yeah. so focused on, you know, we'll hear things about compensation and like, oh, you have to pay for, a co- pay for your fucking coach. Their cap doesn't go against the books. Right. If you have to lose an asset, lose it. It right. might be worth your while. If you're sitting there, right, and you're, I don't know, the Leafs, and you're going, we really need someone good. I I would be like, I'm going to call Jared Bednar up. When well, the Abs call, I mean, honestly, Jared Bednar would be good in Toronto. That's interesting. He would be great in Toronto. Wow. I love him. And they, that's a I big pocket that team, guy. right? Yeah. What do you care? Pay off his contract with Colorado and then hand him Seriously. a fat one for yourselves. What do you care? You have money. You're the Leafs. This we is need the drama. This is, but again, this is, if you really are trying to win, identify who should be the coach, not who should be the coach of who's available. Like that's yep. a winning strategy. I'm sorry. It You're happens right. in every other sport at every other level. Okay. I'm done. Okay. Even assistant coaches. I'd yes. like to with current assistant coaches. Like if you're a team that goes, we need defensive stability, call up Philly and be like, Hey, we're going to talk to Bradshaw five minutes ago. Yes. Why not? If he doesn't want to leave and he's like, I'm really content here by all means, enjoy. Yes. But why not wait for someone to be fired to have that opportunity their contract to be up? Yes. See? Put New us Hill in charge. Zion, I'm with put, you. Us, put us in charge. Okay, we have one more bit of news, and I'm just going to let Shayna go because Shayna is the one that broke it to the freaking world. Shayna, what happened? Ryan McDonough got traded back to the Lightning in uh, with a fourth-round pick. It was Edmonton's fourth that was sent with him in exchange for a seventh-round pick this year in 2025 second. And it's an interesting deal because let's face it, when he got traded to Nashville the first time, I think a lot of us went, this makes sense for Tampa Bay. It's a tough decision you have to make to balance the books and winning costs you on the books. And who would expect a 33 year old or a 32 year old, whatever he was at the time to keep playing at this level when he had four years left on his deal and he was a good fit for Nashville. But you look at the defense and go, well, Sergachev didn't step up in matchup minutes. Chernak doesn't look good without him. The defense is a total wreck. You need to do something. And you need to also, like, not just sign Stamkos, but I think if you're going to push him to sign for less, you need it that you're like, we're competing around you, so let's make this all work. I think that's your best strategy. So they trade back for him after he, I don't know, killed it with Nashville this year, played at an elite level, was unbelievable in the playoffs. So are you betting on him, I think, at 34 years old to still be the player he was you traded away? It's a tough bet, but hey, it's a good deal for them. It's a great bit of business for Nashville. And if you're a team trading with the Lightning and you're getting offered picks in 2025 and 2026, take them and fucking run. The Lightning are right. They don't need them right now, right? Their picks aren't valuable to them. The window of contention is these players won't help them. But if you can benefit off that, why not? Sarah, a lot of people a are- great point- bit of business. <laughs> people are pointing to the cap situation and or what does this mean about- the lightning kind of a little bit to Shana's point, but to the lightning thinking that they're certainly not done. And that maybe this means of course, and there was, there was an implication 
that this that Stamkos is now in fact coming back based on a conversation between Ryan McDonough and Stammer after the trade was consummated. Um, there's also, a, well, it's not a report, it's a fact. Barry Trotz came out in his availability and said that part of making this move happen was that the player did ask to be considered to be moved. So when we, besides the fun of it, and besides maybe, you know, the fact that there is a fit for Tampa, when we look at the intricacies of the deal, pleasing the player's request, but also taking on a not insignificant cap hit for a team like Tampa that that's that their window is potentially starting to close. What do you make of this move? You got to figure out what's happening with Stamkos before you see where the dominoes, I guess, start to fall here. But I don't think they're ever going to operate as if they're out when they keep making the playoffs, you know, because they're still giving teams a pretty tough time. I mean, the Panthers are a tough matchup for them, but it's like the way we view certain teams at the beginning of ends of their windows, it's like they don't often see it that way, right? Like still... Meanwhile, you want the Leafs to keep fighting to keep making rounds, but we're like, are the lightning done? Like, I think if they keep making the first round, they're going to keep acting like they could win the cup. Absolutely. Can I, yes. Can I asked you as you brought up the Leafs, like, <laughs> of course, it's I funny. I, I said, well, we keep bringing them up. They just, it's so organic. They're mad. I you're, took out the segment, but listen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're the lightning, you look at it and you go, we have Andre Vasilevsky, who maybe he came back from back surgery too soon. And that's why he was just iffy this year. We still have Victor Hedman. He played at a really high level this year. Stamkos was great. Kucherov, look at what yeah. he did in play. Like, you have your elite core. Should you keep pushing it every year you have them? Because you said everyone's going to push Toronto to do that. Is that like, is that the way to do it in today's game is obviously they have those supplemental deals that got kind of expensive and that's where you have some trouble, but like, if you have this elite core and you build up a core like they do, I think few teams can compete with that core. Why not keep going for it, right? Like, why not? Why would you think your window is closed? And I feel like if people view it that way for the Leafs, like we need to start looking at the Lightning that way as well because they there's a way to do it if you can get smart. 100%. Yeah. 100%. All right, well, let's talk about the series that have been and will be. Uh, let's start with the one that ended most recently since we last recorded with y'all. And that was the final game that came about in the West between the Avs and the Stars. Now, the team certainly made it worthwhile. It didn't end in regulation, or excuse me, this one did end in regulation. I'm confusing it with the double overtime game. Oh, no, this is the double overtime game. It's all it's all a blur. Spaghetti. It's all spaghetti. But, you know, again, Colorado with losing some pieces and Dallas just being as powerful as they are, even without Rupe hints, um, they go ahead and they secure not just the series win, but some extra days of rest while the other Western series went on. In my opinion, the team that should have won this series won this series. And now the big variable for me will be confirming that Rupe Hints will be good to go going up against Edmonton. But are there any other takeaways that you have from Colorado, Dallas, Sarah? Um, Jake Ottinger has been pretty good. And I, I feel like holding his own in that chaotic of a series was probably a good confidence boost for him. Um, he has the best save percentage and goals against of any number one goalie throughout these playoffs, which is kind of, it's been a mess with like who's switching in and out in net and stuff like that. But I think he's getting better the more they go on. And that's how I feel about the whole team. I feel like they're getting more confident and stronger. And like, the, it's just the absolute gauntlet they went through until now they face the Oilers, which is going to be a different type of gauntlet, but they exercise the demons with, the, the Golden Knights and then the Avalanche were so fast and so hard to get past that I think it might be their year. It's always wild when you see a team be as dominant as they were in round one, like Colorado was, and then not look really the same. And obviously, again, the loss of Alan Shushkin was a big deal for Colorado, but Shayna Dallas has now offed the last two Stanley Cup champions. I don't know if I put a ton of stock in that, particularly with Colorado, because it's been two years and a lot of changes, but are there any key takeaways for you from this series for Colorado? 
I think if you're the Avs, you do have to look at the last years a little bit and be like, okay, we were taken out by two very balanced teams, right? And I think last year's version of the Avs was a lot weaker. They didn't spend much. Their depth was totally decimated from their cup year and they fall to the Kraken. And then you come a year later and you lose to the best balanced team that there is in the Stars. So I do think there's something to consider there, but I think it's more just like, if you're going to go forward with their approach, which is speed, skill, and a fuck ton of star power, right? And that works for them at their best. Then you need to be sure that star power is going to be there and ready. And the fact that Nichushkin wasn't for the second straight year, I think you need to have a long, hard conversation to figure out if that trust can be rebuilt. And it's not going to be an easy thing. And I think it's not as simple as just throwing this on Nichushkin and blaming him and going, oh, they ruined, he ruined their season and whatever but i think that there is a i i really like how jared bednar like talked about this because it's not an easy conversation to talk about and uh, i would look up his quotes i'm not i don't have them off the top of my head but i remember reading them being like i really like how he put it both ways about the business side of it the game side of it the human side of it and all of those have to be factored but if you're the abs and here's your star one of your star players he's not your biggest star but he's an important star and he's gone what shot do you have against these balanced teams? So I just think that's maybe my biggest takeaway from this. It's not, what do the stars do to, I mean, the abs do to rebuild their team and how do they change their approach? I don't think they change their approach. I think their approach is what makes them so special. They're in a loaded team at their best. And we saw that in round one, how they totally dismantled the Jets defense and goaltending. But you need to be sure injuries happen and things like that. Predictable things happen. You can't have the same thing bite you three years straight. Well, if we look back at the Too Many Men Cup choices from this, let's see what we had here. We all, well, oh, Sarah, you did pick Colorado in six. What's wrong with me? I don't know. (laughs) Even though I I had them, I have the stars winning the cup, but I just like change everything all the time. Sarah Sarah had Colorado in six. Shana and I both did pick Dallas, but we had them both of us in seven games. So Shana and Allison with a point, Sarah with no points out of that one. Uh, The next series that concluded, actually the one that concluded before that one was one that I know all three of us were watching. And if you want to talk about a gut punch way to go out, um, this was the Rangers and the Hurricanes. The Hurricanes battle back to really make this an exciting balanced series as far as the series totals even though the games were pretty balanced and then in game six they go up to a three to one lead everyone seems convinced including myself I'm not going to lie that they are going to force a game seven and then all bets would be off and then beauty boy Chris Kreider comes in with a natural hat trick the Rangers ultimately secure the win on Carolina Carolina ice It just looked brutal for the Hurricanes while the Rangers celebrated, again, arguably the better team, but the Hurricanes are out for the one millionth straight year, even though they built up offensively going into this playoffs. People don't necessarily pay as much attention nationally to the Hurricanes as they do to maybe some other teams with questions about what comes next when you continually can't take that next step but maybe they need to about the Hurricanes. And Sarah, I know you've written about this. I know you've really paid attention in terms of analysis here. They have secured their head coach for the foreseeable future, but what are the big question marks for Carolina given what they haven't been able to do in recent history? There's no cap space. Um, There's everybody in the world to sign. They have something like eight free agents and three RFAs and one of them is Jarvis, who's going to get at least eight million. I think um, you have to resign Gensel after what he did. Um, you have to let Brett Pesci walk, probably, and he is the pillar of their defense. So then, what now? You can't just replace a Dougie Hamilton with a Tony D'Angelo again. Like you're not going to get the cheaper options, even though you're in a position right now that. There's difficult decisions on the table. Like, what would Kokaniemi go for? You might have to trade him to free up some cap space. There's just a lot of questions, and none of them are squeezable into going in a positive direction. Like, they don't have space. They have things to do, and it's going to be the most interesting offseason. We will definitely be paying attention to that side. On the flip of things, Shayna, 
this has seemed to be a storied season for the Rangers in a million different ways, not just what the team does, but with individual narratives. But how monumental, particularly if this team goes on to get to the cup final and per chance win the cup, how monumental is Chris Kreider's performance going to be in this game six? Oh my God, it was huge because you look at this and you could easily see the se- the series slipping away from the Rangers. And it's not to be dramatic and like, oh, the nerds, they just want Carolina because this mm-hmm. was, I keep hearing, now I'm going to rant. I keep hearing shit about, oh, the nerds are rooting for the Canes because that's going to validate their work. Hey, fucking idiots. Do you want to mm-hmm. talk about the last few Stanley Cup champions who used data? The Lightning did. The Avalanche did. You want to talk about an analytics driven front office? Vegas did. Almost every team has it. It's just varying levels of how they use it in their organization and how, right? We know the Canes have a heavy influence with their data. That's not everything here. So no, the nerds are not just picking the Canes to pick the Canes. I originally, in my original bracket, picked the Canes. And then when we did this, I said the Rangers because I knew the vibes were different. I felt different. And then you hear constantly like, well, should you change your model because the Rangers are always the underdog? First of all, I don't have a fucking model. (laughs) I do not make models. I'm not smart enough to do it. So no, I'm not smart enough to change it. And should you factor in their matchups and things like that? No. And should you worry about things that aren't expected goals because they don't matter? They do matter. Because if you look at past champions and look at teams who have won, the Vegas Golden Knights were an elite five on five team. They were a great team in terms of expected goals. They had everything and more. The same is true with the Avalanche and the Lightning. A couple teams that buck the trend are not reason to redo everything. Should you still look at it in the offseason and see what you can adjust and improve? I'm sure everyone does that. And most yeah. model builders are very open about it. But to to say like, oh, well, they keep going against the odds, like because they're a special team and because they have moments like they did in game six to turn a game around that they were losing to stop the series from slipping away from them. Not every team can get by being as opportunistic and making as much of as little as the Rangers generate, but they do it. That makes them special. It doesn't mean anything more than that. And it drives me up a goddamn wall because of the Rangers advance. That's what I keep hearing as if I'm actively rooting against them and rooting for the Canes. Sorry, that's my rant for today. You're you're accurate and people are losing their minds a little too much. You're completely correct about literally just get a better power play, get better goaltending. I Mm -hmm. guess it's that simple. It's not easy given the cap situation, but the two things that lost the edge for Carolina were literally goaltending and power play. It's that simple. I would say star power because how often do we look at a game and go, well, star can flip a game on its head in two seconds flat. They got Gensel. They got some star power. I feel like they still need a little bit more. Aho and Gensel aren't enslaved. And like, I think they need one more. Maybe it'll be Jarvis. I mean, he had a torn rotator cuff, so he couldn't do it. Well, if we look at the Too Many Men Cup results, as was said, we all picked the Rangers. However, Sarah and Shayna picked them in seven, and I picked them in six. So I pick up the extra point in that matchup. Um, but let's flip. We're not going to, we're going to go out of schedule order now because we're going to flip that narrative of what we just talked about on its head. And let's look at the last series to conclude. And that was Edmonton, Vancouver. This was a team in terms of Vancouver that did have the edge on the series that did have star power that didn't seem to perform and ends up giving up the last two games to Edmonton. Games that were not necessarily dominated by McDavid or McDavid or Dreisaitl. What do we think about this series? It was another team with a magical season. Vancouver doing far more than was expected of them. They hit some bumps. We will talk about the Brock Besser of it all in a minute. But let's talk about the series first and foremost. I was one of the lone believers always in Vancouver. Everyone else seemed to be all in on Edmonton the whole time. I thought Vancouver really had a chance, but they did seem to falter. Sarah, what contributed to their demise, in your opinion, other than we know no goaltender and Brock Besser obviously misses game seven? Yeah, I mean, it's impossible to win the way they win with the third period comebacks without your top goal scorer. It's just like not set up for consistent success just yet. But I think it was really telling of where the team could go. I mean, Demko is going to be back. You've got PD locked up. You need more from him. Um, if he wasn't hurt, I know Tuckett called him out, um, which is a good thing. Like he's got to step up. Um, him and JT Miller worked together when they put them together, but it's just, 
you can't, you gotta show up on time. Like you just have, you can't keep tempting the fates like that. And you need your Vesna finalist goalie and your top goal scorer, like you just do. 100%. And to that point, you know, that was kind of the star mm -hmm. power I was talking about, Shana. What are the lessons that Vancouver maybe needs to take from the Rangers? You know, I, I'm expecting Quinn Hughes to say he was battling through something. He did not look like himself to me in, in the second half of the, of the Nashville series or this series. Um, and uh, PD was certainly not where he needed to be. So when you do have stars and they don't show up and you can't go ahead and, and, and shut things down when you have the one game advantage twice um, or you have the opportunity to close out the series twice and can't do it, what are the lessons they need to learn? I would say you need your star power. Like as as deep as they made their team and I think that they did like they had a really good third line at the end of the day like you can't only get by with Connor Garland saving your season and creating yeah. offense like you yeah. want him to support what the top guys are doing and that would be my lesson and also like goaltending still matters and it's not on the Canucks and she loves was great right like he did everything he could and more but I think it's interesting after the last two winners everyone's like well you don't need elite goaltending anymore and it's like no if your team is built a certain way, you can get by without that core element, but not everybody can. I wonder if that would have made a bit of a difference, but it's just like you need to create more offense. That's what it comes down to. Like you can't, we always say, oh, we need a good five on five team. And like, that's what strikes against the Rangers. But it's like, you need to be good on both ends of the ice still. And that extreme defensive way of playing is not always the most sustainable, especially when you're going up two of the best stars in the game. Yeah, I, I was interesting. I was looking at goaltending because we had talked about this, how about how there's the debate of looking at goals saved above expected, not just in total, but by game and then also by shot. And Shelov's was not the problem. I mean, even though yeah. it's not Demko, it's not like uh, game six, I thought he looked a little tired, but he was certainly, he was fine. But yeah, it's a, it's going to be very interesting. Okay, so before we move on from this series, it, it is important to talk about Brock Besser because honestly, all of you like, mouth breathers who seem to think it's funny to like point out that oh well, all of a sudden just blood blood the blood clotting issues are a thing please shut up um but brock besser um was out and for the foreseeable future even if they had continued to play with a blood clotting issue um our good friend um mark uh, uh, i can never say his name properly with the french accent mark antoine godin has a great you did it that, <laughs> who's to who's to say <laughs> uh, had a great thread pointing out that blood clotting has been an issue for some time. And then um, Greg Baylock, who's one of the great goaltending minds on Twitter, pointed out that this is also an issue that really affects goaltenders quite a bit. And I mentioned this the other day um, during a radio hit, you know, my mind does go to the fact, they say that this has something to do also with being hit and then the impacts of that on your blood's ability to recover. And this is a Vancouver team that of the teams remaining into round two had the most air travel of any team and the most sustained time going up and down, having that pressurization. I had a personal friend who got a blood clot on a plane because there can be impacts from that. I don't know anything about Brock Besser's situation. I think it sucks, but it just seems the situation was ripe for anyone who's going to be susceptible to this, to have this impact. I also think it absolutely sucks for a guy who has dealt with so much. And to your point, Sarah was such a huge part of his team this year um, to be without Brock Besser. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was a little bit of the shell shockedness that we saw from Vancouver in that game seven. Like, how do you say like, oh, we can go do this when you just had to face that news, but anything either of you want to say on the Brock Besser situation? It's awful. I mean, he was on fire. He was becoming that player that we, I mean, I think a lot of people root for him. He's a Minnesota guy. So you've got like the state of hockey behind you. And then you're in this huge market in Vancouver and the story with his dad and, and everything. And he really popped off this year and you just want him to be rewarded for that. Like it's heartbreaking the way he was playing this postseason was single-handedly like lifting them past multiple games. Like there's no getting to the second round without him. So yeah, it's heartbreaking. I hope he can come back. And I think that threat was so illuminating, right? Like it's it blocked shots can pull up the blood. And then they're like, there's a ton of theories that are anecdotal, of course, but the theories are so interesting. And it's like, how can we get the trainers to kind of be aware of, I mean, I'm sure they are aware of this. They're some of the best people in the world, the NHL trainers, but how can they prevent this? 
Shane, any comments on Brock Besser? Yeah, I, it's horrible. Like you said, like it was such a tough year for him last year, not just like with his dad, but then like his performance struggled and people just wanted him traded. And I love how he responded to it this season. And you could just see he was so in his element. Like he was the star they needed in round one when Pedersen's game was slow. So obviously hoping for the best that this is an issue they can deal with and it doesn't affect his career. And, you know, there are other examples and everyone's case is different. I don't know enough, but you could see around the league, like with Steven Stamkos, he came back better and Chris Kreider, like changed a lot of lifestyle things. I remember when he had a blood clot issue too. So yeah. that is the bright side. Like there's hopefully a, a smooth path to recovery for him and that he can come back stronger than ever because you never want to see someone's career get derailed by anything, especially an issue like this. So I'm, I'm just hoping for the best for him. And I also hope like it's not weighing on him that the team mm -hmm. lost that last game without him because it's mm -hmm. not his fault. It really right. is not his fault. Right. That's, that's a really good point. Yes, we all agree. Um, the lone series I lost in this round was this one. Um, both Sarah and I picked Vancouver in seven games. Uh, Shayna gets a point and a second point for picking Edmonton mm -hmm. in seven. Uh, the final series that was in round two was of course, Boston, Florida, another situation where the team comes from behind to potentially make it a series for a hot minute, that being Boston. But Florida is able to salt away the victory 2-1 in the final game six. Sarah, in your backyard again, so we go to you first. Any takeaways on what Boston was able to do in total, given that most of us didn't even have them making the playoffs this year? Yeah, I think your point there is key, and it's something a lot of like the sentiment around the Bruins world right now is that it's like you didn't have a one C or a two C like, what are we doing here? <laughs> and it's not going to get any better. Spoiler alert. Like it just, it, it raises the question of how, what's the difference between being a good regular season team and a good playoff team. And all, no duh, it's having players that can play against elite competition right so you look at that and you're just like the Bruins have not had that in a while that's the take Shana the series feels like it ended a year ago with so much else that has happened in the hockey world what do, what will you remember about what the Bruins were able to do and what the Panthers were able to do um they've been super strong all year and in this postseason what are your main takeaways um I agree the Bruins need to be better in the postseason and it's funny because I think narratives in years past will tell you that they can just make it into the playoffs and be fine and it kind of shows you like how times change and how a team's identity changes or how the perception and the reality don't always line up even if they have a history that says otherwise and I think that's important to remember um it's interesting because I feel like I expected to hear more shit about Boston losing a game because of the goalie interference mm. stuff and I thought that would come up more when the Dallas Colorado game happened. Yeah. Because that was wild. Something else there. Um, Can we chain this piece on that, please? Yeah. At the athletic. Yeah. I stayed up till 4 30 in the morning. Please write it. I, read I figured it. out coaching thoughts. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I just look at Boston and I'm like, there's definitely work to do. And I think that they're in a better position than they were a year ago because, like, now they know they don't have centers and they need to get them. And they have up-and-coming talent. And I think that's something you can, like, harness in because there's a way to embrace this new core that starts with McAvoy and Poshnok and then, you know, guys like Mason Lorai jumping up and Brennan Carlo and even someone like Geeky being effective in this series. Like, I think that the building blocks could be there, but I think that their road to true contention is going to be a little bit tougher than some of the others because they don't have as great of a prospect pool or a team that's known for all of their development. So I, it's going to be interesting to see, like, I, I, do they trade their way out of this? Because that's usually the Bruins way. Like, what do they do next? Well, we will watch that, of course. If we look at the final series of round two in terms of too many men cup standings, guess what? Shana and I both picked Florida but I picked Florida in six, so I get the bonus point. Uh, Sarah, loyal to the core, to her hometown team, did pick Boston in six. Um, for round two standings, Shayna and I were tied with five points, but that still allows me to sustain a very small margin in the overall Too Many Men Cup standings. I have 16 points, Shayna has 14, and Sarah has 10. So let's see what we can do to impact those standings as we move to the conference 
finals. We're down to two series, two exciting series. One starts tonight. We are recording Wednesday. So by the time you hear this, potentially, you've already seen game one, but we haven't. So let's talk about, like we usually do, one storyline to watch as Florida heads up to the Big Apple to take on the Rangers. Sh uh, Sarah, what is your major storyline that you're paying attention to in the East? How far can the power play take the Rangers? Like it's their a weapon and it's been so consistent and has not wavered. It's like, how can they keep doing it against the Panthers? Excellent. Shayna? How do the Rangers contain the Panthers stars? Because Lindgren has not has not skated until today he's dealing with something and his game is really dragged down fox does not look healthy at all and i think we saw the rangers have to shift their usage in round one uh to round two by making kendra miller take on the heftier workload in round two and now that means with jacob truba back on his pair which is questionable but it's the way to spread out the depth that they do have on those pairs and now you're not just dealing with the Gensel and Ajo line. You have Carter Verhage and Matthew Kachuk as the Clutch brothers. And then you have Barkoff and Reinhardt on the other line. And that's going to be a huge test for that. Excellent. I can't believe no one said this. I am going to be watching the goaltending, of course, because people who didn't necessarily follow Bobrovsky in Columbus, he used to be terrible in the postseason. So I always laugh now when the narrative is always like, well, Bobrovsky is so good in the playoffs because he used to be terrible. So I'm going to see which team can have the better play in net. It is time for predictions. Sarah, what's your pick? Rangers and seven. Rangers and seven. Shayna. Panthers and seven. Ooh, gosh. I. Mm. You know what? I'm going to go against what I put in my bracket, and I'm going to say Rangers and seven also. So we shall see. Um, in the West, uh, the one that, again, now West Coast bias, woohoo, yay me, um, I'm actually a little bit more invested and interested to see. And this is Edmonton traveling to Dallas. Dallas has gotten some much needed rest while Edmonton will be on their way down to the Lone Star State to start that series on Thursday, staying in an every other day game cadence more or less. Sarah, the storyline that you're paying attention to. Will Connor McDavid break all the Gretzky records? That's my question. Like it. Shayna? The impact of Chris Tanev and adding at the deadline on defense versus the decision for the Oilers not to add and stick with Nurse and CC. I know they've broken him up, but Tanev's been excellent. He took on Jack Eichel, won that battle, took on Nathan McKinnon, slowed him down. Now you have you know, the, the dry settle and McDavid are split up. You have two defensemen who can take them on. How does that look versus what the Oilers have to offer? Excellent. I will be watching for depth scoring on both sides, because for me, that's been my rationale for why I think Dallas is the team that will win. So if their depth scoring can continue to produce, although, like I said, the stars weren't necessarily the players that pulled Edmonton into this conference final per se. So we shall see. Um, all right, Sarah, your prediction. Stars and six. I'm going to keep going against the Oilers for some reason. Shayna? Stars and six. I will go stars and seven just for shits and giggles. Okay. So we shall see. All right. Perfect. Well, that thus ends our hockey talk. Don't worry, guys. As these games get fewer in number, we have on deck. We're going to go through the wag jackets, all 16 of them. We're going to give you our thoughts. We may even do a ranking or tiers. Who's to say there are people who are very anti-ranking? We'll see. Um, but we still have time to finish this episode the right way. And the right way is with our very favorite game. And that is Fuck, Mary Kill. It's that time of year where these are easy to pick because we're just going through all the finalists for the major awards. And this week, we are up to the Calder the Calder Trophy finalists. You have on deck, Sarah, for your Fuck, Mary Kill candidates, New Jersey's Luke Hughes, Minnesota's Brock Faber, and a guy that maybe you've heard of, Chicago's Connor Bedard. Go ahead. Yeah, I got to kill Luke Hughes. Um, that's not to say he's not going to be a great player in the years to come, but he's a tier below the other two. I'm going to fuck Brock Faber. I mean, he 
ate an ungodly amount of minutes for a team that wasn't good and he was still objectively good like in any other year you might put him as the Calder winner if it's not Connor Bedard and I'm marrying Connor Bedard even despite his time out he was running laps around everyone and even came back stronger so we I, I was headed towards favor while he was out with his job jaw injury but then he came back and tore it up again so Shana yep same uh Kilu Q's, I did not have him third. This is Tyson yeah. Forster er- er- erasure, so sorry. Um, I will fuck Faber. Faber made this a closer conversation than I think a lot of us anticipated. The issue, which, surprise, surprise, he hit the rookie wall at the end of the year. He was asked to play a ton of minutes, and you saw his game kind of struggle a little bit at the end there. I think it's really hard with the call there to also compare defensemen to forwards because – what is our criteria for this besides like this is a rookie I think is good it's one of the weirdest awards to me in terms of criteria because they're like isn't one it feels like it's just who's the highest scoring rookie so sorry Brock but he's going to be amazing for years to come so that's your win and then I have to marry Bedard because he did a lot with the little in Chicago he was outstanding I know his defensive game needs work whatever 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 I'm not worried about that with prospects and young guys because it takes time and when you're on a team as bad as Chicago that part of your game is probably going to struggle All right, I am going to kill Hughes also, but just to be difficult, I'm actually going to flip. I'm going to fuck Connor Bedard because, again, he is obviously very gifted. He is super talented. To your point, Shayna, he's going to be a special player for years. And don't come for me. Connor McDavid didn't win the Calder either, so it doesn't matter. It'll be fine. But I also believe, to your point, that a defender has a different set of asks when you come into the league. And so to still do what he did not just in terms of points, but in terms of execution and over not just the tons of minutes in games, but also 82 games. Like that's a huge ask for a rookie. And I think that what he did given those caveats and also I'm fighting against the bias where like, I feel like rightly Bedard came in and everyone's like, well, he's going to win the Calder, right? Like it was just presumed. So did we ever truly look at this and say objectively, set aside the bias and who was the best rookie so i'm just being a little bit difficult to be difficult but that's why i flipped those last two that's all i got i like it all right my friends that is how we will end this episode we're having fun watching hockey we hope you are too we did get one vote for a watch along that we missed that's our bad but maybe we'll see if we can get one going in round three if we three have the time between all the great hockey going on on both the women and men's sides It's a super fun time to be a fan of this game. If you want to let us know what you'd like us to watch along, please sound off on social media. You can find us at two underscore much underscore man on both the Twitter and the Instagram. It's also our little handle on YouTube. If you prefer to watch these via video format, Lord knows why, if you're looking at my face right now, but you can find us there too. You can also rep too many men with some merch, some hats, some sweatshirts, some burn books, whatever you're feeling maybe a nice little beverage holder as you watch the games. That's all at TooManyMenMerch.com. And until we meet again, we ask you all to please do something, no matter how big or small, to make sure that hockey truly is for everyone. We will talk to you soon. Love you. Bye.